This is part of a panel where we'll be um, sharing these videos and so that there's just great opportunity for patient education and learning about uh, heart disease. And tonight the topic is living with chronic angina. Again, I'll acknowledge Gilead supported having this talk uh, brought to us and uh, my giving it, but we're gonna answer that question and also address a number of steps here. And we'll be going um, into what is chronic angina. We'll give you a definition of that. Um, how chronic angina is a part of a lot of people in America's healthcare and what you need to think about with your healthcare team and as well as what you will be able to address at doctor visits. What are treatment options for this condition? living with this condition, and then what are resources for people who are managing chronic angina? But first, we're gonna talk about defining this term. What is it? It's a common symptom of coronary artery disease. It's heart disease. It can represent as a symptom, so think of it as something you will feel or experience, and that is described as a pain or discomfort in your chest usually with exercise, usually there's a demand on the heart that will bring out this pain. So you're asking more of your heart, which is providing the circulation to your body, and in demanding more, you can bring out this pain that we've named angina. It can happen during emotional stress. People might not think of that, but if you think of emotional stress, such as anger or even just overall stress, um, even sadness, uh, those things can bring about chest pain or angina. And it's really your heart's way of telling you that the heart is not getting enough oxygen. So it's the symptom, um, and we'll talk about where it can happen, but it can be in the chest, it can be in your jaw. I've had patients who present to me because they've gone to their dentist and their dentist says, you know, no, it, it's not that left jaw. There's not a tooth issue. You need to talk to a heart doctor. And so angina could be chest, jaw, neck, back, shoulder, um, a real wide range of where you can feel this symptom. When the heart needs to work harder, you need to think about the heart is a pump, and then there are arteries that actually supply the muscle of that pump. And those arteries can become blocked, and that's a reason that the arteries can't give more blood flow to the heart muscle. So that's the drawing to the left of the slide, and you'll have all this in your chronic angina resource book that we've given you. But this slide shows how you can have a narrowing of that artery, and that artery is a means for getting blood to the heart muscle. Obviously, a narrowing is going to impact that. So if you have a narrowing and you subject increased demand or, as I just told you, emotional stress, which is another demand on the heart, the result is angina. So on what is it? Um, there are different types of angina, and I think that's part of what I want to help clarify tonight for everybody, that you can have chronic angina, which is where we're focusing tonight, and that's usually short-lived. So we can usually identify a trigger, something like going up the stairs, doing your exercise, being angry with your family or <laughs> whatever situation might have that emotional stress. But it's gonna last usually less than or equal to five minutes and then resolve. It can be predictable, as I said. You could say, that's my trigger. If I go out in the cold and think about doing something outside, wow, I notice my chest. So cold temperature can be a trigger. It can be relieved by pausing on what you're doing and then, um, or by taking medicine, and we'll go over the medications we use for angina, but those are typical things with chronic angina. It's predictable, short-lived, and you can actually get relief by uh, modifying what you're doing or by using a medicine. And so we're gonna compare this chronic angina to other types of angina that are also what your doctor might talk about or, or what you as a patient might experience. So first we have the chronic or stable angina. And as I said, the pattern, the trigger, and the duration. Just keep those in mind. For chronic and stable, it's predictable. It's triggered by emotional or extreme physical stress, or extreme emotion, truly. And it's short-lived, relieved by rest. 
but take a step down and we're going to talk about unstable angina. And this is more moving into emergency type situation where it's unexpected or it's a change in your stable symptoms. So I've had patients describe to me, um, you know, in the past week I do half a flight of stairs and I get pain and it's still there. It takes 10 minutes for it to go away. If that pattern is accelerating, they're moving into more of an unstable pattern. And here trigger could be even at rest, accelerating during sleep, something that wakes someone up when they're asleep and they wake early in the morning with this chest discomfort. And this discomfort can last, if you look at duration, longer than 30 minutes. So it's more of a stuttering but a prolonged series of symptoms. And that's a flag to people that this we're moving out of chronic stable into unstable angina. And again, angina is overall chest pain. We have less common uh, terms that we use with angina. Uh, the last two rows, variant angina, can be sudden and without warning. And this can be a challenge for physicians and for patients, obviously, um, that the chest pain can just have no identifiable trigger and will just occur spontaneously. You can have microvascular angina. I do a lot of work with women's, women and heart disease, and what we know about women and heart disease, one area is that they can be prone to experience microvascular angina, and that is a different type of angina than the chronic stable pattern. There's some overlap, but that's another uh, type of angina. And when we talk about microvascular, the picture I showed you of the artery is a large cut out picture of a coronary artery. And those, we have different size arteries throughout our body, but the microvascular angina, think of almost the tiniest type of artery you can have. And that's usually where microvascular angina can start. So it's a little different. So in thinking about angina, you're not alone. Even though I think people might not be able to put angina together with their chest pain or their symptom that they're facing every day, but many people in this country have it. 13 million Americans have coronary artery disease, and that is a main starting place for people to experience angina. And that is well represented in the picture you have of the artery with the blockage. That's an example of coronary artery disease. Nearly 9 million people in America have chest pain. And stable angina, so this pattern that I described for you with the triggers you can identify, lasts less than five minutes, relieved usually by rest, sometimes with medicine, that's the most common type of angina. We'll talk about what it feels like. I've been really using words like chest pain, um, and I talked about the jaw, but this uh, picture shows a good list of what angina can feel like, and that can be different from person to person. We're all different. We all have different makeup. And it, in a way, that's a, a good thing, a great thing, but in a way, it can be frustrating for patients. But you could have chest pain or pressure. Sometimes you see the Hollywood heart attack, elephant sitting on the chest, someone clutches their breast, and, and they say, wow, that's a heart attack. But it could just be an ache. I've had patients who have a pain between their shoulder blades that was off and on and, you know, hey, it did happen when I walked up a hill or worse in the winter. It can be in your shoulders. It can be both arms. Some people at the front of their elbow, they'll have just an ache and they'll say, wow, I really can feel this ache. Some patients have no chest discomfort. They become winded. They can't catch their breath. They start to do more exertion, but this feeling that they can't catch their breath is the most limiting for them. In women, I do a lot of talks for women to educate about heart disease, fatigue. And that's a tough one to, to figure out um, who isn't fatigued. I'd say probably everyone could raise their hand to being fatigued. But when women were asked after having a heart attack, what was the one change you could identify? And they'd say, you know, it was, it was this sense of fatigue and it's, a, it's out of proportion to a normal. I, um, hard to describe more than that, but here I think this is a good way to say it. Overly tired could be a symptom of angina. Feeling faint could be a symptom, having nausea, sweating, general weakness. 
and then at the bottom we'll just highlight. We know there are some differences. In general, chest pain is what human beings feel, but women can have more symptoms like nausea, back, or jaw pain. So really learning about all these different symptoms that they can relate to your heart um, is important. So we'll talk about what can be triggers uh, for these symptoms. So if you think of triggers, think of what would make your heart work harder. And that's going to be something like exercise. That could be lifting heavy items. I've had patients who come in after they move. So if you relocate and you're doing a lot of the packing and the lifting yourself, that's something that was out of your normal. And that's sometimes where they'll find these symptoms or experience these symptoms. We've talked about the emotional stress that can trigger it. The extremely cold temperatures are known triggers. I hope everyone in the room knows snow shoveling is a big demand on your heart. So we see a lot of heart attacks in winter months when people, when we get a big snow, especially the heavy wet snow, that can be a big stress on the heart. Eating a large meal is making your heart do more. It's making your heart get blood flow to the digestive tract so that you can digest your food. I really want you to focus on smoking. The most preventable cause of death we know is tobacco use and smoking. And in this case, to this talk, it will cause that blockage that I showed you in the artery. I keep talking about my artery picture. Smoking will tear up the lining of the arteries and cause plaque to build up. But smoking one cigarette is a demand on the heart. It increases the work the heart has to do. So you're really stressing your heart when you're using tobacco or smoking. So other common causes um, are conditions that would slow blood flow to the heart. And that will cause angina because the heart is needing more than what it is receiving as far as keeping that pump strong and helping that muscle be strong. So if you think, I've talked a lot about that narrowing of the arteries. We can break down the word atherosclerosis, but athero is artery, sclerosis, hard. You get hardening of the arteries, and then that can end up narrowing the arteries, and therefore you cannot get the blood flow where it needs to go when you have more of a demand on the heart. If you have blood clots form in the arteries, our body is very good. If we cut our skin and bleed, we can stop that bleeding. So just a, a small injury won't cause you to lose all your blood. Why is that? That's because your blood can clot off. If your blood clots off in an artery, that's a problem. You no longer can get the blood where it needs to go. So having blood clots in the arteries can limit the heart blood supply. Heart failure is a term that uh, I want you to think about. That's that's really a weak heart. So a heart that is just not able to pump as strong as what is needed. Uh, the ultimate heart failure would be the heart not working at all. Um, and when, when a cardiologist talks about heart failure, we're really talking about that the heart muscle is weak and not able to augment or give the blood supply where it needs to go. So that's another reason that you could have angina. You simply cannot because of a weak heart muscle, you cannot have your pump do what it needs to do. When we look at other medical conditions, um, anemia. Think about anemia. Anemia is a term that refers to low hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is part of your blood that carries oxygen to the body. So if you don't have enough hemoglobin, you're effectively not getting enough oxygen to the heart. So anemia is a reason people have angina. Aortic stenosis is a valvular heart problem that can limit how much the heart can pump the blood and move the blood. So you can have angina just based on that aortic stenosis or valvular disease. And finally, um, I think everything relates to the heart, but thinking about your thyroid, your thyroid is really your metabolic rate for your body. So if it's overactive, it can demand a lot from your heart. And that's another condition where we know we can cause angina or chest pain if the thyroid is really overactive. So what risk factors are there for having chronic angina? Um, part of why I really am interested in doing these talks is I'm very motivated by prevention. We have data that shows that women can lower their risk of heart disease over 80% by lifestyle changes. Recent study just came out showing the same thing in men. 
So it is in people's control to be able to modify their risk. If you can get to goal weight, if you can stay active, eat a heart healthy diet, and there's a lot of information about how we can do that, try and manage um, coronary artery disease, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, I've already talked about smoking, and then managing your stress. These are all risk factors for causing angina and causing heart disease. So if you can get on top of risk factors, and really if you look at a lot of these, some of these are from your parents, so you can't pick your parents. Your genetic hand is what you're dealt. But a lot you can control, so why not try and modify your risk as best as you can? You can really impact whether you get heart disease or chronic angina. So if you have chronic angina, and I'll keep talking about this term, but what if you have chest pain? How would you even know that you had this condition or that you had heart disease? So a physician would take a detailed medical history and ask questions about the symptoms. So we, they would be teasing out how often, when did it start, is it predictable, what are your triggers, how long does it last? Just a lot of questions. There are usually blood tests involved, checking the risk factors that I gave you on that last slide, so your cholesterol, your blood sugar, other ways through looking at your serum and your blood, we can see your risk. Um, different tests, there, I tell my patients there are just so many different ways to look at the heart. We're looking at all the different things the heart does and we practically have a test to look at all those different things. So we can use an angiography or an x-ray, that's a way to see if there's an open artery to your heart or if there's a blockage. There's the electrocardiogram where we're tracking the electrical activity of the heart. So that's another test that can be used. If we want to check, okay, how do you do when you put a demand on your heart? We have you exercise and we monitor for any adverse symptoms. You would report any symptoms. We check how much you can do as far as exercise. And then we check how your res heart responds to the exercise. So the stress test can give a lot of information about someone's heart function or whether they have coronary artery disease. And then possibly they could be referred to an interventional cardiologist, which uh, there are a number of different subtypes of cardiologists, and the interventional cardiologists are the group who can open up a blockage in an artery using a balloon and a stent. So that's a procedure that is a way to directly go after that narrowing that I showed you. So that's another possible track when someone has chronic angina. And the reason we want to look at treating chronic angina, we want to ease symptoms. So if you're limiting what you're doing, if you're modifying your activity because, well, if I go out in the cold or if I try and do my regular walk on this route that goes up a hill, both those times I know I'm going to get chest discomfort and I have to stop, we want you to be able to be active. We want to prevent problems such as heart attacks. So if you have progressive coronary artery disease or progressive atherosclerosis, worsening and narrowing the arteries at some point that does increase your risk for heart attack and you can have abnormal heart rhythm disorders you can have what i talked about the unstable angina the more emergency type picture with angina so let's talk about how we treat chronic angina so the treatment depends on your overall risk of heart disease. So when we talked about how you're diagnosed with angina, the doctor and the team of providers are going to get a lot of information about your heart function. Did your parents have heart disease at a young age? Do you, did you smoke? <laughs> Everybody's stopping smoking. So then we would encourage you to stop smoking, to do everything you could to stop, to really try and modify your risk. Your doctor your primary care, your cardiologist will talk to you about your preferences and really get an assessment on um, which direction you want to go. But the goals, as stated, are to help you be functional and not have limiting symptoms. So we want to get rid of pain and discomfort and then help you keep your normal activities. So thinking about, hey, where am I? Where do I want to be? And getting you there. The treatment options for chronic angina are, uh, actually we have a lot of different options for treatment. Uh, lifestyle changes, I think, can take you very far in improving symptoms and helping your heart health and helping your heart function. 
There's a program called, called Cardiac Rehabilitation, so Cardiac Rehab, and we have a number of very good programs here locally, but that is a structured exercise plan, and I have another slide coming that'll go into that in detail, but that program has been shown to reduce death. I like these kind of simple information <laughs> where it's a it's an endpoint. So people do better when they go to cardiac rehab. It's the education, it's the support, it's the giving the patient the tools to keep going and have a heart healthy regimen. We do use medications to help manage chronic angina. And these are anti-anginals, so medicines that reduce the chest pain or angina. And then we have antithrombotics, so we're trying to keep those arteries open. So the antithrombotics are coming at the blood supply to the heart from that direction. And then there are also medical procedures. I briefly mentioned the interventional cardiologist and getting the revascularization or blood flow back to the heart as another option. We're gonna go into the lifestyle changes a little bit more here. Um, the slides have a lot of information, but let's just go through this. So how would you eat better? Okay, in my 15 minute appointment with patients, I could say eat better, but these are specific. So look at foods that are low in cholesterol, avoid saturated fats, trans fats, and sodium. We know that sodium is not helpful for cardiovascular function. So minimizing that, trying to eat in moderation, avoiding the large meals. It can be very social to have a large meal, but it's really a stress on your heart and on your body to eat in that pattern. If you can relax and reduce your stress, so sometimes that's modifiable, sometimes it's not. But I've even had conversations with patients to say, can you think about changing your work? Your work life is impacting your heart health. So other ways, if you can't avoid the situation using meditation, yoga, exercise. Um, I could add exercise in for everything here. It is medicine. But deep breathing, getting enough sleep, doing activities you enjoy can really help reduce anxiety, reduce that stress, and give you strength. So I, I won't flog you with the stop smoking. But being avoiding secondhand smoke reduces your risk for heart attack. And how do we know that? We've seen that in studies of communities that have put in smoking bans for nightlife places and have had reduced heart attack assessment in the emergency department. So it's that clear. Um, if you can move more, and I often will tell patients, people, and I can understand this, are intimidated by being told to exercise. I just tell them, move your body through space. Our bodies are designed to move. So whatever you like to do, even if it's just adding in walking somewhere as a destination to get it done. So it doesn't have to be a formal 40 minute a day. We really now know the data says that being as active as you can most of the time is very protective. And that gets into looking at how many steps you're taking and thinking about just how much am I moving my body. You wanna, with chronic angina though, you really wanna watch about not overexerting. So it's a balance and part of cardiac rehab is learning that balance and learning how to fine tune. Maintaining a healthy weight helps keep the cardiovascular system strong and healthy and then gives your heart a break if you're at goal weight rather than increasing demand and stress. When you look at other cardiovascular risk factors, diabetes is a known coronary artery disease equivalent. So if you can keep your diabetes in check, that will help protect your heart and keep your heart function strong. And I'll also add to that a condition like hypertension or high blood pressure. You might not feel that you have high blood pressure, but it will contribute to coronary artery disease. So keeping your high blood pressure under control really reduces your risk. Taking your medications as prescribed is important. So oh, we'll talk about the team who helps with that, but um, knowing why you're taking each medicine, even just you know an idea and understanding side effects that could happen are important. Getting an annual flu shot. When we talk about stress on the body and increased demand on the heart, having influenza or just a bad viral illness can be a big stress on the heart. So any way to avoid the flu um, is important, so getting a flu shot is part of that. Cardiac rehab is, as I said, a structured, supervised program, and it will help improve overall health. It's designed to really educate patients. It's like CardioSmart, only it's on a 
one-to-one -one basis or FaceTime with your exercise physiologist, the providers at cardiac rehab. You'll get education about chronic angina, so at like a session uh, classes in this setting or even as the patients are exercising. It's tailored exercise training, so you can really get a starting assessment exit assessment and in between patients learn okay i've improved what am i going for what's my prescription as we say when they finish with cardiac rehab there are a lot of tips for heart healthy diet you can meet with a nutritionist and figure out how to regulate your diet strategies to reduce stress are part of cardiac rehab which is very helpful they do an assessment to see if someone is facing depression we know that depression can make managing heart disease more difficult and vice versa social support and coping skills we know those are very important for successfully managing chronic angina and i've talked about this so the cardiac rehab focuses on lowering your risk It'll bring together a whole team. So you have physicians, nurses, exercise specialists, nutritionists, psychologists, and other healthcare specialists. I mean, it's like my ideal office visit over a series of sessions. <laughs> so it's really a high yield program. Medications for chronic angina can be in different classes. You can have anti-anginals. So I talked about those, those reduce chest pain. You can have nitrates which help relax and open the blood vessels so you get more blood flow to your heart. You can use beta blockers. Those help because they can slow the heart rate and they decrease the demand on the heart or the work that the heart has to do. They lower your blood pressure and help in that way. The calcium channel blockers can also lower blood pressure and help the heart work better. Renolazine is a medication that helps improve blood flow and I tell patients it helps the muscle work better. So these are medicines obviously prescribed by a physician. You need to have a dialogue with your provider who um, has indicated that these will help you, but they all can help manage angina or help you live with chronic angina. And we have some more. The, um, the medications, two notes, they can all interact and they can all have side effects. And I'll add a third note, every patient is different. So understanding how you react to a medicine, understanding why your doctor thinks this medicine is good for you, and just clarifying with your team to say, okay, I'm taking X, Y, and Z, or you might have a number of medicines, but how are they interacting? The other one um, that could be added, as I said, is the aspirin or the ones that will help keep the arteries open, meaning reducing any thrombosis and reducing heart attack risk. And again, talking to your doctor, I just, I tell patients side effects that I expect from a medicine that I've seen from other people, but I tell them, let me know. Every person is different. Every medicine can have a different effect. So just, you need to just let your provider know. Medical procedures. Um, if lifestyle change and medications are not minimizing someone's symptoms or they're having progression or ongoing problems there are procedures that we use to help with chronic angina and these are really on you know a basis a dialogue with your heart specialist or your cardiologist but it can range from the pci angioplasty stent those are all words for percutaneous coronary intervention and that's the procedure that's done in a cath lab it can be an outpatient procedure um, and there you can actually open a blocked or narrowed artery with a balloon that dilates the artery and usually a stent is placed to hold the artery open. You can have coronary artery bypass graft surgery, which is sometimes termed open heart surgery, but that's literally where they would, through different means, um, be able to bypass the blocked arteries, either with someone's veins or from one of their own arteries in their heart. Another, I wouldn't, I don't know that I'd call this a procedure, but this is a treatment or almost like a therapy course that can be prescribed for patients with angina, enhanced external counterpulsation. And this is a procedure where it's, it's, it's a regimen where you go for a period of number of weeks daily during the weekdays and large cuffs, uh, like a blood pressure cuff, are put on the legs and the low abdomen and they inflate and deflate to the timing of your heart. 
Now think back with what I've talked about with angina. We know that the angina comes because you're not getting enough blood flow to the heart. And we've talked about microvascular angina. We've talked about coronary artery disease, blocked arteries causing angina. The enhanced external counterpulsation, actually those cuffs inflate when your heart is getting its blood supply. So it actually helps your heart get more blood supply. When your heart goes to pump the next heartbeat, those cuffs deflate. And so it's much easier for your heart to pump the blood. So I tell patients, this is a way where you can go and over time of having your heart get this treatment, actually it's been shown to reduce angina. So it helps with that symptom. It, it's a, it could be a much longer talk on its own, but um, I just want you to understand that this is another way of managing angina. There are limitations and there are people who are not candidates for having this enhanced external counterpulsation. If you have artery problems throughout your body, you're not gonna tolerate it well. If you have severe heart failure, this involves lying down flat. And some people who are really limited by heart failure cannot lie down flat. So there are certain parameters with this external counterpulsation, but really this slide does address the medical procedures, things that are a bit more involved, but can help treat angina. So thinking about where the blockages are in the coronary arteries, how severe the blockages are, how many arteries are involved, and then someone's overall health are all variables that we use in calculating, is this someone who could have a stent? Is this someone who we need to talk to a heart surgeon? Is this someone who could do enhanced external counterpulsation? So there are just a lot of factors involved. So how would you get to that? So you're gonna to talk to your healthcare team and through doctor's visits are how we're gonna figure that out. And this is a whole team. So following up with a primary care physician on a regular basis is very beneficial. We know from a blood pressure standpoint, we know they can monitor your overall and heart health and they will coordinate and refer you to a cardiologist if it looks like um, that is where you need to get specialized care for your heart and circulation. The nurse is a key part of your care team. They answer questions. So patients, again, the physician gets about 15 minutes, maybe 20. There are a lot of questions and often, I find myself do this, I'll think of the question as soon as they go or when I get home. And so if you make a list, the nurse is a great resource and you can call and talk to them and they can often do a lot of education. And they're working with your physician or healthcare provider. So they will help educate you. Your caregiver, it's always nice to have a family member or a caregiver with the patient. Two years or four years are better than two. Um, but the nurse can also help with that just to get everything clear. So understand side effects, reiterate that, emphasize the importance of follow-up visits, and then going over lifestyle changes. So just, it's a, it's a lot of, as you know tonight, it's a lot of information that we can give to patients. So having a team is key. The cardiologist is the physician who's gonna work with the family doctor to help diagnose or manage chronic angina. They may order additional tests to understand someone's overall heart health, so that could be part of trying to figure this out. They'll give you tips about living well with angina, and they will help choose treatments that match your goals, your lifestyle needs, any other medical conditions you have, so the cardiologist provides that aspect. A pharmacist can be very key in helping you understand, okay, these are medications, this is chemistry, how can you help me understand when I should take it, um, how I should take it, what regimen. They actually do a lot with helping with insurance coverage because I am talking about medicines. Medicines have a cost and the pharmacists are key as far as looking at what your plan is and how best to work with your doctor to, to get success. And then looking at how to make sure you remember to take your pills. So if you get into a number of pills, it can be a challenge just to get a schedule and be able to take them effectively. So thinking about a caregiver, that can be a trusted friend, that may be a family member, but they'll provide support and encouragement to you as you're learning more about your heart and managing it, help with medications. I have a lot of family members who help manage medications. Um, 
looking at what you need to do. So if chronic angina, we talked about that increased demand. So I tell my patients every fall, we start having this conversation. You're not going to shovel the driveway, right? Right. Who's going to shovel the driveway? What's the plan? So we'll talk about that. Um, but the caregiver can help with that. If it's a grandchild, they can come and shovel the driveway. Um, but just someone else to help understand, hey, the doctor said this, you know, let's circle back and, and figure that out. I like this section on preparing for your appointment with the doctor. And um, I think one way of thinking about it is, you know, again, in that short amount of time that you have with your specialist or your provider, they need the headlines. They need to know, you know, chest pain. What is this? What is the symptom I'm having? So they need to know kind of the, the big, the big print. <laughs> they really don't have time for all the small print, but you being active and part of your health care is important. So knowing your medications, dose and frequency, um, that is very key. What past tests you've had, the doctor can review those and look at how those impact what we need to do next. Um, have your own health history. So looking at surgical procedures, do you have diabetes? Do you have other conditions that you're managing? Um, and then understanding why you're there to see that doctor. So you might come in with a symptom, but make sure that they understand how that impacts you and where you wanna be or where you think you need to be as far as um, getting on top of your angina and knowing what you need to do with it. So as I said, be ready to report, kinda of, you know, give them the headlines, like when it happens, the triggers, we talked about duration. Um, how it affects your life. So that gives us perspective on knowing how we can improve how you're doing and then any other concerns. So it's um, important to find out what people are facing and what they're trying to juggle. I've had patients who put things off because they're a caregiver for another family member and they say, okay, how can we manage it now? I really need to be here for you know someone having surgery. So balancing all of that. Um, Cardio Smart is an excellent website. We've given out the information for that, and um, the name itself is great because it's getting patients Cardio Smart, so it's where you can look for more information. I think getting any questions you have that you want to know out of that visit, write them down ahead of time is perfect. So that way you can have, you know, these are examples for angina. Can I prevent episodes of angina? How much exercise is right for me? Does chronic angina ever go away? What's the difference between angina and a heart attack? So these are questions, if you've been wondering about it, a lot of times having it written down and just say, hey, let's start with those. Patients, I'll go in to see a patient and I'll see their list and I'll say, okay, let's hit the list. Let's just go through it. Sometimes I even just write down the answer so they don't get home and say, oh, I think we talked about it, I don't remember. Um, but all of, all of these questions are perfect, and if you can go in with that, and if you have your detailed information, it's a much more high-yield interaction with your provider. And then long-term, um, one thing about heart health and heart disease is it is over a number of decades is the goal, that it's many decades that you can work with your provider. We're always doing new research. We're always finding out new treatments or ways to manage heart disease. So there are follow-up appointments, and I encourage people to do that. I've had patients who have had the bypass surgery and are told, you're cured. They're not cured. We're managing it. So come back even if it's every one to two years if you're doing really well, but you've got to just touch base. So follow-up appointments are key. Close tracking of your other risk factors, being in control of what you can control, and not trying to change everything in one day. No one can change a number of different habits in one day, but you take one thing at a time, and over time you can really impact your risk. And then an ongoing commitment to a heart-healthy lifestyle are very important. We're going to move on to living with chronic angina, and I know we've been talking about that, but it, specifically for people who have chronic angina, there's a balance of having to pace yourself, watching for signs that you might be overexerting, so really learning your own body's reaction, um, finding an exercise program that's right for you, making sure you warm up and cool down. You can't just jump into exercise. That's a stress on your heart and your body. And then sharing your feelings, letting people know how you're doing with all of this. Cardiac rehab is a great introduction to being able to take this forward. 
When you look at medications, it's really important to take your medications exactly as directed. If you don't understand why they're directed like that or you need a different way, ask. Don't just change, ask. So skipping doses, changing the timing can affect how the medicine is helping your angina. So talking to healthcare professionals whenever you have a change in regimen uh, is important and not stopping a prescription or over-the-counter medications. I often ask patients, are you taking supplements? What, what are you taking into your body? Because it really can impact the other medicines you're taking. And here it can impact how you're responding to your treatment for angina. So keeping an updated list is very important. And as I said, including over-the-counter and herbal, and I would say any supplements that people are taking. So keeping that up to date as well is important. Knowing when your chronic pattern or stable angina might be something more is a key part of managing chronic angina. So angina, when you shift over to unstable angina, that can be dangerous. And that is a tough line to figure out, but it's knowing your stable pattern and a change to that you need to pay attention to. Um, if you get unexpected signs, like as I said, the person who got their symptom at a less effort or if it wakes them up from sleep, uh, those are flags that something has changed and there's been an abrupt change. And there, I tell people, call 911 because the squad can treat you when they reach you. I've had many patients brought in by family members, but the, the, the key thing about the 911 is that they can treat you immediately. They can do an EKG, a cardiogram in the field, figure out is this a heart emergency where we need to you know, have the emergency department, the cath lab, everyone notified. So you know, I, I, I emphasize that to patients, that's very important that the squad can treat you immediately. So yes, it is an emergency squad, but they are trained to treat an emergency. And when someone has shifted to unstable angina, that is an emergency. So when to call 911 if you have ongoing symptoms five minutes after using nitroglycerin, which is one of the medicines that we talked about for angina. Um, if it, the symptom is not going away and it seems to be getting worse, that's a reason to call 911. If you take the medication, it helps, and then the pain comes back. That's a concerning sign. So it means that you partially helped something, but there's a process that is taking over and getting worse, so reasons to call the ambulance. So we'll talk about resources and support, or for support and information. CardioSmart is patient education. This is from the American College of Cardiology. CardioSmart.org has extensive information, so all aspects of how to live a heart-healthy life and to do well with heart disease or to prevent yourself from developing heart disease. Um, Speak from the Heart, our patient education designed specifically for patients. So um, high yield as far as looking at experience, looking at uh, what you can learn as far as having to deal with heart disease. And those are two examples of the websites for those. And then finally, Medline Plus is health information, so that's up-to-date research. There's research all the time on how to help reduce the impact of heart disease in our society. It's the number one killer. So, and not that it's a contest, but more women die than men. So we really need to impact heart disease. Mended Hearts is a peer-to-peer -peer organization where people can learn about and share experiences. And I think that it's, just, it's very high yield, so whatever, nugget you can take from uh, this talk this evening. This was a lot of information, but um, there are good resources if you come up with more questions. And I will say thank you here, and um, we can close for questions or get some questions in just a second.